I'm going to share some insights. I've through some international trips very recently. And uh, in general, I'll just sum it up before I even begin and say it's very positive. Very positive in that through the efforts of the KDA, uh, Commissioner Quarles, the staff at the KDA, Kentucky is poised to literally be a major player on a global scale uh, for industrial hemp as an industry. And uh, almost without exception, everywhere I visit, and we get to talking about, well, how do you do this? How do you do that? Uh, Kentucky, because of the regulations and legislation and administration we have in place, is in a wonderful, wonderful position to be very competitive. So uh, we wouldn't have what we have without the legislation, regulation, and administration of the program. So we're, we're very, very lucky that we have that here in Kentucky. So I'm going to talk about, um, about three trips that I've taken recently. The first one, uh, through uh, my uh, relationship with Tyler, who just spoke, uh, to Uruguay. So let me ask you, when I say Uruguay, what do you think of? I'm sorry? Llamas. Okay. Yeah, alpacas. Warm weather. Okay. Yeah, good point. Yeah, I'll just go ahead and talk about that real quick. So Uruguay is the only nation in the entire world, in the entire world, that has fully legal cannabis. Now, you can go to Amsterdam, been there. I won't say none of that, but I've been there. And, uh, you know, there, you can, it's, it's, it's not legal there, but it's overlooked. Uruguay has a fully legal cannabis industry, and it's very structured. Uh, you can go to the drugstore and buy some if you choose to. You can grow your own. Clearly, there's a limit. You know, you can't just grow acres and acres, but you grow whatever you want. Or you can join a cannabis club, a social club. We visited one. They grow their own. They, you know, people just sit around and smoke. So uh, it's totally legal in Uruguay. And that's very different than, than any other place that I've ever visited. So it does add an advantage, potentially at least, to their hemp industry, right? But the point I want to make is that I'll share my vision or what I thought of Uruguay before I went there. So probably not highly developed, okay, generally speaking. Um, uh, you know, economically, not really all that great. That's not the case at all. It's a highly, I'll just say, European-type country. Uh, all the folks that live and work there uh, are of European descent, most, most of them, of course. And uh, it's not at all what I expected it to be. And very, very forward-thinking, clearly, uh, uh, regarding cannabis. And so they're excited about their industry. So if you don't know where Uruguay is, uh, it's between uh, Brazil and uh, Argentina. So it's a little country about the size of uh, land mass of Florida. So not a, not a great big giant country. And it's about the same latitude as northern Georgia. Northern Georgia. So not a whole lot different climate or at least uh, latitude day length uh, than what we have here, which of course is always important. Uh, one really cool thing about their agriculture, they're heavily based in corn and beans, like Tyler was talking. They have a, a large beef industry, like many countries in South America have, but they have this pulpwood industry too. So uh, all, almost all these grain farms, this is the grain crop in front of us here, they'll have one hectare of a pulp crop. And it's almost like our CRP program in the United States. The government pays the farmers to grow this pulp crop for a period of time. And we're not talking about that this is just going down the road, so it's not a great photo. We're not talking about saw logs, right? We're not talking about lumber for building or whatever. It's for pulp. And we just I thought that was very, very interesting. Uh, and that's a very successful program there. But by far, most of their efforts are in grain. They're grain production, corn and beans. And so I would offer, you know, like Tyler uh, was mentioning a moment ago, that the potential is very high for Uruguay to participate on a global scale. They do now participate on a global scale with corn and soybeans. So there's really no reason to think that they can't, especially with their very moderate <coughs> regulatory uh, environment, that they couldn't compete very well with uh, industrial hemp. And I expect they probably will. Uh, we visited several large, large grain farms, and uh, they're highly productive lands, not unlike the central United States, so they have the uh, agronomic expertise, they have the infrastructure, the equipment, uh, they only need to get started. And so that's why we were invited there, uh, was to help a couple of uh, what I would call leading business people in that part of the world uh, maybe uh, get started with their hemp industry. And so I expect you'll hear more from them in the not-too-distant future. 
Um, I will note that, I mean, these hedges, they're just really cool. Uh, they, they're strategically placed, again, very European, right? You see that in Europe, a lot of places, uh, and you see it here in Europe, like, too. Uh, they do have some big-ass lizards. <laughs> I mean, if that thing were on its hind legs coming in your direction, you'd be looking for a tree or something, I, I believe. So, uh, you know, a little bit different in that regard, uh, relative to what goes on here. Okay, I'm going to move on to uh, some experiences very recently uh, in Australia. Uh, I attended the National Australian Hemp Conference, and this is a photograph of the participants, and uh, they probably had about 200 people, not a whole lot more than are sitting in this room, right? Not a whole lot more than are sitting in this room for a state-level hemp uh, industry thing. So if that's any indication at all where Kentucky stands on a global scale, uh, participation in the, the local conference, uh, I mean, that says a lot, right? Uh, the people that are active or interested in the industry present here today, and there, there's the one in Australia. Uh, it was largely attended by Australians, a uh, few New Zealanders. I'll talk more about New Zealand. Uh, there were a few international guests, uh, myself being one. Uh, you may recognize uh, Jeff Kostick, who's the agronomist with Hemp Genetics International. HGI has a large positive presence in Kentucky. So I've known Jeff actually since 2015. Uh, he's a Canadian agronomist and invited me to his research farm more than one occasion. I've learned so much from Jeff, and it was great to spend some time with him in Australia. Uh, the normal, you know, the normal stuff, the what stuff we all see at all hemp conferences, uh, that how to harvest, how to grow, you know, the same old uh, song and dance. And uh, I don't mean to sound trite, uh, but, you know, there's just not a lot of new information right now. Uh, so uh, you generally end up seeing a lot of the same stuff no matter where you go. So one of the best parts of this trip, and hemp-centric parts of this trip, uh, was a, a little short flight to Tasmania. Uh, and uh, we visited uh, both the production farm, hemp production farm, and the university research farm, which was clearly right up my alley. I love that. A lot of fun uh, in Tasmania. Again, the hedges, uh, this, uh, this, these countries are uh, very, very heavily uh, influenced by Europe and, and European practices and protocols, and uh, you know, we just don't have that here, uh, even in places where it would probably serve a great purpose. So agriculture in Tasmania, pretty much the same, uh, heavily based in uh, livestock, uh, in particular beef, uh, and also grain, corn and soybeans, uh, just like we see here. Now, Tasmania, let's see, let me make sure I get this right. They are about the same latitude as Chicago, if I'm not mistaken. About the same latitude as Chicago. Why do I keep saying that? Who cares? That has everything in the world to do with day length. That is day length, defines day length. So it actually goes a long way to defining their agronomic protocols for hemp production, uh, just like our latitude uh, in Lexington or Kentucky does as well. So there's a, a quick photo of an irrigated hemp grain crop uh, in Tasmania, a pretty good looking crop. So they, they do, the, the irrigation is different uh, in that part of the world. Uh, they're encouraging irrigation to increase yields, and so there's a lot of government support uh, for that type of activity. Uh, unlike here, where we pretty much shoot each other over water rights, uh, it's not quite the issue as far as finding water, and the government is very, very supportive of promoting irrigation to increase yields, which increases GDP, right? So that's why the government is, uh, is happy to do that. Uh, they do suffer some of the same problems that we're all familiar with. I think Nicole, I've seen Nicole here. Are you? I'm Nicole? Here. Yeah, yeah, hi, Nicole. Our plant pathologist in the UK doing a lot of work with hemp diseases. Uh, they do have a sclerotinia problem there that's very well known and described in Canada. We see it a little bit here, uh, but, uh, but you know, in general, you know, we're not talking about the giant, giant reductions in yield, but it's a real thing and something that we probably need to pay close attention to. They also had a reasonably serious insect problem. Are there any entomologists in the room? No? Well, so I don't remember the name of this thing, so that's I won't be embarrassed by trying to figure that out. A little caterpillar that uh, burrows into the stem and kills the plant above the point that it burrows. So uh, that could be clearly pretty serious too. But again, at least in the case of this crop, you know, we're not talking about huge reductions in yield. So I would guess that to be at a thousand pounds per acre or better uh, when push comes to shove. 
Okay, next stop was the uh, was the university research farm, which again was just a huge amount of fun. Uh, I mean, that's what we do, right? So it's a lot of fun to visit a totally different country, part of the world, and see how that goes. So uh, just quickly, that's the entrance road uh, into their farm, these two fields on either side. So if you look at this little field, this brown stuff, that's what it was. Can you identify that? I'm sorry? <coughs> Cotton. No? Opium poppies. <laughs> Opium poppies. Oh. So somebody in UK pharmacy, when I asked, told me that almost all of the opium in the United States, and I'm talking about legal opium, not you know heroin, uh, comes from Turkey. Comes from Turkey, which you know to me was always just a really weird thing. Why would we grow our own? have control over the crop under highly managed condition, right? You know, you just don't plant poppies everywhere. But it's actually not the case. A great deal of the legal opiate uh, medications come from Tasmania. They have a huge opium poppy production system in that country. Highly regulated, clearly. I mean, they literally know the moment you plant, they literally know the moment you harvest, they, they camp plants, they, you know, it's a highly, highly regulated uh, thing, but I just, I didn't know that until I, I learned that. Uh, I, I've never done that in my whole life, right? Uh, I've held a, a, a Pinocchio poppy uh, and all the seeds, yeah, so just a very, very odd experience. But that was not the main purpose of our trip. You know, to them it's just another day. They were probably, like how silly we were, to go on and on about, you know, you grow poppies here? But, uh, they, they also had an excellent uh, hemp research program. Uh, this is Dr. Mark Osanama, uh, the agronomist there, and uh, another one of his colleagues and a graduate student. And we had a great visit. Uh, they were doing things similar to what Dr. Woos was talking about. Nitrogen rates, nitrogen application timings, and so forth. And they've been growing hemp in Australia for a long time. This is not new, right? And they're just still working on some of this introductory stuff. So again, an indication of where Kentucky is relative to the rest of the world, and I would say in a very, very positive way, very positive indeed. Uh, we did see some really cool stuff there, and I'll go ahead and note that we've begun an email conversation. Uh, it's not practical to have telephone conversations very well with that part of the world, but um, or Zoom or whatever presentations. Or, uh, we, we almost certainly will have a strong, strong collaborative effort uh, with folks in Tasmania regarding some uh, research efforts. So probably, uh, I, I didn't know this, uh, but they tell me that there's an effect on potato yield if you grow in the southern hemisphere versus the northern hemisphere. And I, I don't know why that is or really even what the effect is, but we're going to see if there's any effect on him as well. Or any other that, that just have to be yield, but uh, so we'll do some fun stuff and, and hopefully some useful stuff too. All right, now uh, last stop, New Zealand. Uh, absolutely, one of the, in my opinion, uh, most beautiful countries on the whole planet. It is absolutely just as green as you probably imagine. If you've seen those, uh, what are those movies? Lord of the Rings, right? Yeah, where they've got the hobbits and all that. Uh, we didn't go to that part and actually see that. I can well imagine you know, a bunch of hobbits running around. It's just it's a green. It's a beautiful, beautiful country. The people were so wonderful. Uh, our host uh, for the hemp portion of that trip was the Midlands Seed Company. And I would offer they have an extremely interesting business model. They are a seed company. So they, they started out and have made a very, very successful business out of seed production and seed sales to farmers. So, you know, just seeds, so corn seed, whatever, grass seed, they're big in grass seed for forages. Uh, agriculture in New Zealand is heavily, heavily dairy based. I, I couldn't believe all the dairy cattle we saw on, on both the North and South Islands of New Zealand. Uh, it's amazing how much their dairy production is. 70, over 70% 70 of that is exported directly to China. So it's a, it's a very, very profitable enterprise, uh, the dairy uh, business in, in New Zealand. Uh, they even such that they take three months off every year, put their cattle, their cows on dry lot, uh, actually send them to different farms and let somebody else manage them. 
uh, for three months. And I don't know what you know about dairy in the United States or Kentucky. Dairy farmers milk cattle 365 days a year with no exceptions. You can't skip milk. You know, it's not acceptable. Bad for the cattle. So uh, a totally different business model in New Zealand for dairy in the U.S. And I would offer a very positive difference, uh, generally speaking. But that being the case, uh, uh, if they have all the cattle and all the dairy cattle, then it's a forage country. It's a, you almost see no grain production uh, or very little grain production in New Zealand relative to other places in the world, certainly including Kentucky. So hay, uh, forage for grazing, but hay production is huge. Again, the government uh, is all about exporting stuff to China, so they're supporting irrigation of hay production. They buy center pivots for farmers for hay production. I mean, how much irrigated hay is in Kentucky? Yeah, very little to almost none. Right, so just a very, very different way of looking at things and doing business than what we're accustomed to here. Um, so, let's see. <clears throat> Ashburton on the southern island, the south island, is about the same latitude as Orlando. Okay, Orlando. So, uh, a little bit uh, closer uh, to the equator, but... Uh, uh, still kind of weird that, uh, you know, trees like that growing uh, out in the front yard, and this is at the end of their summer when we were there just about three weeks ago. Uh, you know, it, it's their island nations, and so uh, their, their climates are very moderate because of their islands, that Tasmania. Uh, they don't have extremes in either direction. Altitude is what uh, defines how warm or cold you are, uh, not, uh, you know, where the low pressures and stuff come. It's a totally different way of looking at weather than what we're accustomed to. Again, just a beautiful place that uh, lights could be down a little bit. But, uh, again, it's largely a forage production uh, system. Uh, you know, sheep are literally on fire there as far as agricultural <laughs> commodity. Uh, there are just bazillions of sheep in New Zealand. They're everywhere, they're absolutely everywhere. And they're for both. They're for wool, uh, but they're also lambs for meat. Uh, I didn't know this, but you don't really, well, I shouldn't say that. It's less common to eat or kill a, an adult sheep for meat. Uh, they're almost all lambs. And I, I guess that's not a whole lot different than beef cattle in, in the U.S. You know, we don't let cows get really old and then necessarily uh, harvest them for meat. But uh, they definitely don't do that for sheep. They, they definitely eat more lambs. Uh, but again, a big, big forage uh, production area. Our host here was Joe Townsend, so she's an agronomist with the Midlands Company. She took us to three different production farms. Uh, we didn't have a chance to visit her research farm. We, we ran out of time asking too many questions <laughs> everywhere we were. Uh, but this again, this is another situation where these folks have been growing him for a while. This is not new, okay? Uh, I don't know exactly how long, but they're like 10 plus years. So uh, different regulations that we have, another great example of wow, I wish we could do that, what we're doing in Kentucky. Uh, and so very different, but uh, an older industry than what we have here. Uh, Scotertinia again, uh, Nicole. So uh, saw it on both of those islands. And uh, did that show up on that break? And there's a sclerotia uh, and the seed head there. So easy to diagnose. And uh, they, they, again, it's, it's present, but not, not a deal breaker. You know, it's not killing yield to the point where farmers are asking or begging to spray fungicides. But man, they've got some production issues there. I mean, again, this has been going on for some time now. So uh, their, their latitude's a little bit different, and uh, uh, they get some pretty daggone tall plants by the time it makes a grain crop. We all know that that's highly variety specific, right? It depends on the latitude of origin of the variety that you're trying to grow, how tall it will be before day length and sites flower. And uh, they, today, are using a lot of Canadian lines, right? So 40, whatever degrees, 40, I should know, 41 degrees, I think, maybe 43 degrees. So, you know, that's not a whole lot different than Milwaukee or something, right? So uh, they're close to Canada. But these Canadian lines that they're growing uh, are getting awful tall before they're ready to combine. And, uh, I mean, you can see how tall I am. Uh, there's uh, the residual straw uh, after they were attempting to combine. It's a lot of biomass. It's a lot of biomass. And it's not easy to deal with that. It's not a simple thing. The equipment engineered for corn and beans and wheat in particular is not conducive to running or dealing with all that biomass. 
And is Tom Hutchins here today? No. Okay. <coughs> I've, I've said this a million times, and I said it here. Matter of fact, on this trip, uh, Tom uh, provided this quote and his permission for me to use it. They grew it for rope for a reason. Right? When it gets wrapped around things in combines where it doesn't belong, it's a problem. It's a serious, serious problem. So efficiency of harvest is a big, big expense that one that Tyler was talking about a moment ago. So uh, even industries that are far advanced in time relative to ours haven't figured all this out yet. So uh, it's not just a simple thing. Now you can see where we are uh, relative to the crop that uh, has not been harvested yet. That's a lot of biomass to run through a combine. But they can't help it, right? The crop's that big. Uh, they wish that it worked. Uh, I think I, I thought I had a slide that Joe was, was trying to point out. Yeah, there she is. I sure would prefer to be not this tall, you know, but not that tall. Uh, it's a very, very serious issue. So uh, one that we're working on, they're using standard combines. We talked to JT Workman. He's up next, I think. Uh, if anybody figured it out, JT probably will. But um, uh, they are using just standard combines. It does get wrapped around, but it doesn't belong uh, around, and uh, it is a, a serious issue. Somebody asked me this morning about birds. Are birds a problem? They're a serious enough problem there that they have cannons around the perimeter of their production fields. So uh, that's another expense that Tyler hasn't accounted for, but uh, propane cannons uh, around the perimeter of the field. So every once in a while it, it explodes. Uh, you know, they warned us if it does, don't, you know, it's, it's okay. But uh, uh, just to scare the birds off, they'll leave for a few minutes and then they come back and then it explodes again. It's just a constant thing. Uh, in our research, uh, we actually net, Patrick's in the room somewhere, yeah, we put nets over all of our research plots because birds will absolutely destroy uh, grain yields on plot, scale, plot scale production. So we have to cover them with plastic nets uh, to keep the birds out. So if, are you dove hunters? Got any dove hunters in the room? A couple? It's the best dove crop on the planet. Yes, they love it. Them and any other birds. So uh, something to consider. Um, okay, so uh, that, uh, it's not hemp related, but um, it's karma related, right? Yeah, so we all uh, connect to art, right? We all have our personal preferences as the, as the you know, I connect with those guys. I could, uh, I could hang around with those guys, I think, for a good afternoon and probably enjoy myself immensely. Uh, that's at the Sydney uh, Museum of Modern Art uh, in Sydney, Australia. So, uh, a little bit of uh, a global perspective. Again, I'm going to... Uh, reiterate that uh, we in Kentucky are in excellent condition to be world players in this industry. And uh, I'll just finish by uh, stating that pretty darn exciting uh, about the federal legislation and the potential uh, for him to become a quote unquote legal crop. Uh, I'm not a business guy, I'm an agronomist, I grow things. We have several prominent successful business people in this room that what I do know is that uh, even though I tend to be rather uh, conservative in my investments, uh, there's no way in the world that I would uh, bet my retirement on the hemp industry today because unfortunately the DEA or whatever, the federal government, could shut it down tomorrow. So they're, they're absolutely within their right today to do that. So I don't think that's going to happen. I'm not saying that. But it prohibits investment in infrastructure. And you can agree with this or not, but I think in 2017, Kentucky pretty much met the demand for hemp products that our infrastructure capacity could support. And so without more infrastructure and processing, we're, we're pretty much there. I mean, that's not 100% accurate, but that's a big reason there weren't more acres last year. There's nowhere to sell it. And that's because there's nowhere to process it. So as investments in infrastructure and processing increase, demand increases for farmers, production increases. And I think that's exactly what we're going to see in 2018, and I'm excited about the potential. If it's no longer a quote-unquote illegal crop, investors will be far more likely to give him a good hard look as a, a new opportunity in that realm or in that space. So I'm very, very excited about that.